Thank you, Mark, and good morning. And I hope you listened to my reading of Scripture more than I know you will in the announcements. Our text is in Mark chapter 14. We're continuing our studies in this gospel, and we're going to look at verses 27 through 31. The uh, Lord has been celebrating the Passover with His disciples. We can call it the last Passover and the first Lord's Supper. And uh, I'm going to begin reading with verse 26, where we left off last week. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, that this very night before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept saying insistently, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all were saying the same thing also. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's pray. West of Athens, Greece, not Texas, the other Athens, is Delphi. It was the sacred site of the ancient Greeks. Along the mountains, they built their temples. Today, they are all ruins. All that's left of the Temple of Apollo is a few stone columns and a spectacular view of the valley below. But when it stood with all its pillars and glory, it was inscribed with the words, Know thyself. Plato ascribed the proverb to the seven wise men of Greece, and I think we would all agree that whoever coined that phrase was a wise person. We need to know ourselves. But there is a problem, and it's a big one, and it's in that second word, thyself. We stand in the way of self-knowledge. Jeremiah is more specific The problem is the heart. He wrote in Jeremiah 17, 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? No one. That's the point, and that's the problem. But in the next verse in Jeremiah, the Lord speaks and says, I, the Lord, search the heart. He knows it. And he reveals it. So while the words, know thyself, are wise but impossible, the words, know thyself by knowing thy God, are far wiser and altogether possible. That's the counsel of our passage this morning in Mark chapter 14. It is about the revelation the Lord gave his disciples, revelation about themselves that they refused to believe. They had been celebrating the Passover meal, which ended with the singing of hymns. All through the meal, they would sing the songs known as the Egyptian Kaleel Psalms, Psalms 113 through 118. They are about deliverance from Egypt, which the Passover recalled. And as the meal ended they would sing the last of them, Psalms 115 through 118. And they were very appropriate for that moment because they were prophetic of what the Lord was about to do. Offer Himself up as the Passover lamb for His people. And they prepared Him for His struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane where they 
go to after they leave the upper room. Because those Psalms are not only about his sacrifice, they are also about the Father's assurance of deliverance. And so as they went out of the room, they sang Psalm 116. The cords of death encompass me, and the terrors of Sheol come up upon me. I found distress and sorrow. This is what the Lord is singing, and this is what the Lord was feeling, no doubt, as he goes to the garden. But Jesus also sang of his willingness to do that, his willingness to suffer what he was about to suffer and suffer the cross itself. I shall lift up the cup of salvation, he sang. I shall pay my vows to the Lord. In, in spite of the agony, he was pledging himself to undergo death and be faithful to his mission, faithful to the end, to death, even death on a cross. Well, if ever a man knew himself, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew who he was. He knew where he came from and where he was going. He knew those Psalms were about him. And he was pledging himself to be faithful. And throughout the Psalms, his father from ancient times was promising to be faithful to him. The Psalms end with great encouragement. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. I shall not die but live and tell of the works of the Lord. He was singing of his death, but he was also singing of his resurrection and the assurance of God's faithfulness to bring him out of the grave. His loving kindness is everlasting. And you just know that lifted his heart through all of that. Now, isn't your heart lifted when you sing hymns like, Great is thy faithfulness, or a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing? Well, of course, it lifts you up. It encourages you. That is, if you care. And why would we care? Well, we would care if we understand how faithful God is to us in every situation. Because we also sing, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And if we don't think that is the case, then it's because we really don't know ourselves. The disciples didn't. They were all about to wander. And the Lord told them that would happen. The Lord told them that they would leave him. Verse 27, you will all fall away. Earlier he shocked them with the news that one of you will betray me. Now he stuns them with another statement saying, all of you will forsake me. They object. They deny it. They all swear allegiance to him. But no, he said, it would happen just as he said, because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. He's quoting the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 7. What the Lord had told them during the Passover meal and had told them numerous times before that he would be put to death was prophesied centuries earlier. And as when he spoke of his death, when he explained the cup, that the cup of wine represented his blood, represented his death that would be poured out for many, that he, it would be violently shed. We see that again here as well. He would be struck down. But what is significant here is it is God who speaks in that prophecy and says, I will strike down the shepherd. Isaiah 53 indicates that as well. He would be pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, 
and smitten of God. And so what the Lord is doing here is again telling them what is about to happen and what is going to shock all of them and saying, in effect, he knows ahead of time. What is about to happen won't take him by surprise. He knows it well. It's the reason he's come. The crucifixion of Christ was not a mistake of history. It was not the result of a miscalculation by Jesus. It was the result of God's action, of his plan and purpose, one that was prophesied long ago and planned from all eternity. So who crucified Christ? Did the Jews play a part in it? Did the Romans have a hand in it? Yes, of course they did. But ultimately, it was the result of the eternal decree of God. That's what Peter said. As he comes to learn this later, and not very much longer later, the day of Pentecost in Acts 20, uh, rather 2, verse 23, he said that Christ was delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. This is all planned. Now why is that? Because the only way that we could be saved would be if He went to the cross in our place. He had to die for us. He had to be our substitute in judgment so that we would escape judgment. The wages of sin is death, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death. So, either we pay or someone pays in our place. So the shepherd died in our place. The shepherd died for the sheep. It's the greatest gift ever given. His life for ours, our judgment on Him, His righteousness on us, we go free. That's the result. Eternal life for the sheep. But the initial result would be the sheep would be scattered. They would see their leader arrested. They would see him bound by his enemies. He would appear to be helpless in their hands and they would run for their lives and they would hide in terror. They would fail him in his hour of greatest need. He knew that. He knew all about them. And yet, knowing their weakness and knowing all along that they would fail him, he chose them to be his disciples. He gave the greatest privilege of being in close fellowship with him and of hearing him, knowing him, being with him personally, which shows the kind of person and the kind of love that he has. It's unconditional. J.C. Ryle commented on that in his commentary. And then he states, this is remarkable and deserves to be continually remembered. And, and that is true. It does. We should remember the kind of Savior he is, the kind of love that he has for us. He knew them when he found them along the Sea of Galilee and chose them to be his disciples. He knew what kind of people they were and what they would do in his hour of need. He knew them when the Father chose them and he agreed to come and die for them. Now that is sovereign grace. As the hymn writer put it, he saw me ruined in the fall, yet loved me notwithstanding all. He saved me from my lost estate. His loving kindness, oh, how great. It is great. It is eternal. It is unshakable. And we see that in what the Lord goes on to tell his disciples after telling them of their faithlessness, even after they scatter, he says he will regather them and restore them. That's the promise he gives in verse 28 where he says, after I have been raised, well, he's just been assured of that in those psalms that he's been singing. After I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. In other words, I won't cast you off. I'll meet you again where it all began. So be encouraged. That's Jesus. 
a faithful shepherd of the sheep, and a merciful high priest. It's an example of what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. But none of this penetrated the hard skulls of the disciples, the ones who had worried earlier that they might be the betrayer, were now adamant that they would not be disloyal. And none was more vociferous about his de devotion than Peter. Even though all may fall away, he said, yet I will not. Brave words. And no doubt genuine. He believed it. He loved the Lord. He couldn't imagine forsaking him. Now, I don't know if Peter knew about those two words inscribed on a pagan temple nearly 800 miles away, but he needed them at that moment. Know thyself. He didn't. He had an inflated opinion of himself. He was saying that, that he was better than the other ten. Even if they fall away, I won't. That was boastful, maybe not intentionally, but still boastful. But even more reprehensible, it was blasphemous. Unintentionally, I think, but still blasphemous because he denied Christ's word. He didn't know the failure that he was capable of. As I said earlier, the, the truer counsel is know thyself by knowing thy God. And we do that by believing God's word, believing the scriptures. But when we reject the word of God, which Peter and the others did here, what, what will be the result? What will happen? Nothing good. The Lord knew Peter intimately and infinitely better than Peter knew himself. He knew what would happen because he knows all things, but also because he knew Scripture. As a man in his human nature, he studied the Word of God and he believed the Word of God, and he knew the prophecy that he quoted, Zechariah 13, verse 7. And it prophesied that the sheep would be scattered. And so he answered Peter's contradiction of him and his contradiction of the prophet of the Word of God by revealing Peter's future failure in more detail. And here he goes beyond the prophet, and he goes beyond the prophet because his divine nature informed his human nature of things beyond their knowledge and what the prophet himself said. He would not only fall away, but he would deny him publicly before the sunrise. In just a few hours, this will happen. Now, that was a correction of Peter, but really a mild one considering how serious Peter's statement was in disputing the truth of Jesus' words. But according to Luke's account, Jesus also encouraged Peter. It was here that he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. It was a way of saying, Peter, even Satan knows you better than you know yourself. And he can't wait to get a hold of you. What a picture that gives. And how unsettling, and really, how terrifying. Sifting gives a picture of, of violence. It is what a farmer does when he takes the wheat that has been threshed, and he puts it in a sieve, and he shakes it in order to separate the chaff from the kernels of wheat and anything else that's in there that is not desirable. And Satan was eager to do that to Peter, and he would do it. He would be given permission to do that, and Peter would be thoroughly sifted. Pride goes before destruction, the haughty spirit before a fall. But the Lord adds, I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. He didn't pray 
for Judas that his faith not fail because Judas was not one of his, not truly one of his disciples. He had no faith. And Jesus knew that from the beginning. He said back in John chapter 6 and verse 70, one of you is a devil. And he knew which one it was. But he prayed for Peter. And that's an encouragement because he's just a picture of us. The Lord prays for each one of us. Every one of his people. And we need it. Because we're no different from Simon. Satan wants us. Secularists today would shake their heads at that. Seems preposterous to talk about a devil and things of that nature. And they shake their heads and they're dismissive of it to the devil's delight. But the fact is, the teaching of the Bible is, there is a lot going on behind the curtain, so to speak, that you and I don't see. A whole spiritual world and conflict that affects us daily. Now, I am not wise enough to be able to tell you what is the work of the devil and what is the part of the world and the flesh and all of these things that afflict us. I think the devil is behind it all in some way. But the reality is the scriptures teach that that's the reality. That there is a spiritual dimension to life and and There is a war that is going on, a war of deception and temptation involving what Paul calls in uh, Ephesians 6, fiery darts, invisible afflictions that are sent our way. And you are the object of that daily. Every one of you as a believer in Jesus Christ are the object of Satan's hostility and evil intent daily. Now, do you think you're sufficient for that? Of course not. Jesus said, but I have prayed for you. And he prays for us. Our shepherd is our high priest who prays for us personally. He prays for us individually. prays for you individually. Daily, moment by moment. Praying for you now at this present moment. He prays for us for whatever we need. For our strength for wisdom, for a stronger faith, for recovery when we fail and fall. He's always watching over us and praying for us. But again, this was how the Lord dealt with Peter in his overconfidence and failure. He dealt with him with patience. He dealt with him with understanding and encouragement. It's how he deals with us. David knew that well. He experienced it. He wrote in Psalm 103, The Lord has compassion on those who fear Him, for He Himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. He knows us. He knows us thoroughly. So if we want to know ourselves, then know Him. Know His Word. It reveals you to yourself. And it reveals that we are in our greatest strength. Just dust. And the Lord did that here with Peter when he revealed to him just how dusty he really was. Not only will you fall away, Peter, but truly I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. Mark is the only one of the gospel accounts that gives the number of crows as twice. Roosters in Judea crowed regularly at night. In fact, so regularly that the Roman guards would mark their watches by the roosters. The second crowing marked the third watch. So the Lord gave Peter the exact time when his denials would occur giving added emphasis to his statement, truly I say to you, with the effect of, note well, Peter, this is true, this very night this is going to happen. But Peter wouldn't hear it. In fact, he doubled down on his boast. 
Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Well, brave words. Brave words from Peter. He kept saying that repeatedly, Mark wrote. And he wasn't alone. They all were saying the same thing also. The other disciples weren't going to be outdone by Peter in their, his claim for loyalty. And again, I don't doubt that Peter or any of the other disciples meant what he said, what they said. He, Peter proved his determination to, uh, to stand with the Lord. He took a sword with him into the garden. And when the soldiers came, he used it. He cut off a man's ear with it. So he was ready to fight. He was ready to go down fighting like some Maccabean martyr. What he wasn't ready to do was suffer humiliation with Jesus. So when Jesus said, put away your sword, he was stunned. His uh, vaunted courage evaporated and he ran away into the night only to turn up later in the high priest's courtyard and deny Jesus three times. And when it happened, when, when Peter heard the rooster crow a second time, he suddenly realized what he'd done, and he was overwhelmed with emotion. Mark says he began to weep, began to sob. He went from the heights to the depths so suddenly, so it seems. But it's often said, I think correctly so, that a spiritual failure is usually not a blowout but a slow leak. And there's a lot of truth in that. Failures can, be, can appear to be sudden and unexpected, but then so does the implosion of buildings. You know, we've all seen that on the news when uh, an old building is brought down to make room for a new one. And it's spectacular. And as far as the public can see, it, it appears to happen suddenly. And of course, it, it didn't, it couldn't. It was the result of weeks or months of planning and putting the explosives in just the, the right place. And then, in a matter of seconds, a large old building is brought down in a cloud of dust. And so it is with people and spiritual failures. It certainly was so with Peter and the others. And if we look ahead in Mark's account of things, we see that. Well, we see it here. First of all, Peter had complete confidence in himself, overconfidence in himself. And secondly, he didn't believe God's Word. And thirdly, when he got to the garden, Jesus warned the disciples, keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. And Peter didn't. He fell asleep. This was uh, the, the pattern with all the disciples. And it's the pattern in our lives as well. It is all unbelief. The Lord spoke to them. He gave them revelation. He gave them His Word. And they didn't believe Him. They were confident in, them, in themselves. They, they rested on their own strength. They wouldn't listen to the Lord. And as a consequence, they fell. It is so common. Paul speaks of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 after teaching on Israel's failure in the wilderness with uh, its sin and of, of unbelief. Even after the people had been blessed so richly by the Lord, they'd seen miracles in Egypt, they'd seen this great miracle of the parting of the Red Sea to give them escape from the Egyptian army. He would provided for them in the wilderness, miracle after miracle. Paul writes, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. After Israel, had, that had witnessed all of these great blessings, fell into unbelief. What about us? Overconfidence is dangerous. It's rooted in an ignorance of self and in an unbelief or, or indifference toward the Word of God. Maybe indifference is really the word that we should underline there. Judas 
didn't believe the Word of God. He came to that point where he said, I just don't believe this. And he made a deal with the priests. So often it's not that we don't believe the Word of God, at least not intellectually. We're just a bit indifferent to it. We have other things that occupy our time, amusements and distractions of all kinds. And we just let the Word of God take a second or third place. We are always in danger when we do that. We are always in danger of falling into sin and reaping the ruin of it when we do that. We are never immune to temptation. No degree of progress in the faith can justify a lack of caution. The Old Testament gives a number of examples. David may be the best known when he fell into sin with Bathsheba and tried to cover it up by murdering Uriah, her husband. It's, uh, it's staggering. I think we're, we're so used to that story, we can approach it with some uh, slight indifference, but as you think about it, it's a staggering sin and fall, what he did. He was probably a man of 50 years of age when it happened, over his lifetime, he had killed a giant and conquered armies. He had written the Psalms. He had danced before the ark of the Lord. He had been given the promise of a, a, an eternal house. God was going to build him his house. Great promises, great actions, great events in his life. And here he is, around 50 years of age. He seems too old to be lusting. He was too mature to fall into temptation. Remember, he was the man after God's own heart, and yet he fell and suffered for it the rest of his life. We're never too old or too mature not to fall into sin. King Uzziah is another example of a godly man who had a terrible fall. Second Chronicles 26 verse 15 introduces his failure, his fall, <clears throat> with the words, His fame spread afar, for he was marvelously helped until he was strong. Those are haunting words. Until he was strong. Look, it's good to be strong. It's good to be strengthened, but it can breed overconfidence. That's what happened to Uzziah and to David. That's what happened to them when they fell. They were successful men. They had, they had strength. And yet, success in life is not a guarantee against failure. Self-confidence is false security. Any one of us can fall. That's the sobering warning that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12. But then he gives strong encouragement in the next verse in verse 13 when he says, God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also that you will be able to endure it. God doesn't put us in situations that we cannot endure as we walk with Him. It's when we're neglectful of God's Word and warnings and, and deliberately or just due to carelessness put ourselves in the way of temptation that a fall will happen. The only way to guard against that, against spiritual self-confidence and an inevitable fall, is by knowing ourselves. Truly knowing ourselves. But the only way to know ourselves is by knowing our Creator, who truly knows us. And the only way to know Him and know His mind and what He reveals about us is by knowing His Word. It's only by studying the Scriptures that we grow strong and grow humble and grow wise. Thomas Halliburton was one of the eminent theologians of Scotland in the late 17th, early 18th centuries. 
I've told his story before. I'm very impressed with Halliburton. And I tell it again because I think he makes my point well. When he was a young believer, <clears throat> his faith was seriously challenged by the professors in the university he was attending. They were deists. Deism was the prominent heresy of the time. It's equivalent to our Unitarianism. It was a denial of the Trinity, a denial of the deity of Christ, a denial of the atonement of Christ, salvation through the shedding of His blood. It was a denial of the Scriptures. And daily, Halliburton was put through this denial of the truth. He heard these learned lectures of men who were much more scholarly than he at that time, men who had a much greater grasp on the facts or the, the, the thinking of the day at least than he did, and they made impressive lectures against the Word of God. And it challenged his faith. It shook his faith, he said. But his response was not to reject the Word of God, not to yield to what these men said. He held on to it, as it were, by a weak faith. And he would go home from those classes and he would sit down and he would take up the Word of God and he'd read it. And he would read it seriously and deeply. And that only strengthened his confidence in the Scriptures because as he read the Word of God, it spoke to him. And it spoke to him in a personal way. And it revealed to him the secrets of his heart. As no one else could or no, nothing else would. And he realized this word is alive to him. And so using the, the words of the woman in John 4 verse 29, he said, Come see a book that has told me all I, that I ever did in my life. Is not this the book of God? Yes, it is. It is supernatural. And I believe that if a person simply reads the Word of God, and reads it consistently, and reads it seriously, it will speak to him or her and make that point. It did, as it did to Thomas Halliburton. If you would know thyself, then read the Bible. It is a mirror. It is a friend. It shows us who we really are who God is, and it makes us better. It makes us strong and wise. It makes saints more saintly. One last thing. There is an encouraging word in all of this from Luke's account when Jesus told Peter, when once again you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. He would recover because God never gives us up. And in His grace, in His sovereign grace, He even uses our failures to mature us and make us a help to others. He did that with David. Some of his greatest psalms occurred or were written after his sin with Bathsheba, and they are great, and a great encouragement to us. He did it with Peter, and He will do it with us. He never lets us go. But how much better to believe the Lord, to be, to be obedient to Him, and escape life's falls. So look to Him, not to self. Look to Him because, as Paul told the Romans, He is able to make us stand, and He will. And we will stand as we look to Him and walk with Him. If anyone is here who does not know the Lord and is not walking with Him, does not know Him as Savior, you're in unbelief, and your unbelief is the path to a fall from which there is no recovery. It is eternal. It will be great. Why will you die? Turn to Christ and live. And may you who have done that trust Him continually. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your goodness. We are grateful for the warnings that we get in Scripture, such as this, 
And if we're honest with ourselves, we see ourselves in Peter and the others as they were so confident in their faithfulness. But Lord, we're no different from them. We are, as David said, just dust. And we must recognize that and look to you for strength and endurance and perseverance. You supply it and you will, and you'll never let us go. But Lord, give us wisdom that we not fall, that we not fail. Help us to look to you continually. Put within our hearts a desire to read and study your word, to take it in and be shaped and molded by it. We look to you to bless. We thank you for your love for us that is, as I've said, unconditional. We thank you for the love that sent your Son into the world, and we thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming willingly, gladly, going to the cross with the joy set before you. We thank you for your sacrifice for us. May we live for you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.